Happy Friday! It's the weekend! <laughs> and I have one goal this weekend, and that's to make a video and to say hi, to connect with you, let you know I'm alive because I've been away for some time. And I have a very good reason for this, and I won't be sharing until next Wednesday when, when I make the announcement. But I've been really busy last uh, several months actually working on a new project that would expand upon what we've been doing here on the YouTube channel, expand upon building our community. Community. and I'm really hopeful that this will be a good resource for you guys and I'm still working on um, minor tweaks here and there but uh, that's what's really been um, keeping me occupied last um, few months and uh, especially more so last couple of uh, weeks as I've been trying to get this ready for launch and so stay tuned for that announcement but today I'm going to talk about the code of ethics because I received a ton of questions and video requests on this one and though it's fairly straightforward I know that it can be quite confusing with certain um, topics so I'm going to go back to the original source today the AOT PDF uh, on the code of ethics that you can also find online and I'm gonna link this in the video description and I'm gonna go over them pretty broadly and use stories and examples from my own life to help you conceptualize the information and just to give you guys a starting point but I really want to encourage you guys to go back and read the PDF at least once so that you get a comprehensive um, knowledge base on this because it's really important not just for the exam you guys but um, as you consider different um, scenarios and as you come across different experiences, these are the ethics that will guide how you will respond and how you will proceed in this circumstances and situations that might cause moral dilemma. Okay. Now there are seven ethical principles and I'm just going to list them real quick before I get into them more in detail. But principle one is beneficence. Principle two is non-maleficence. Principle three is autonomy and confidentiality. Principle four, social justice. Principle five, procedural justice. Principle six, veracity. And finally, principle seven is fidelity. So let's go right into the first one, beneficence. And you don't need to think too hard about this because you could actually get the clue from hearing and looking at the word, the first half of the word, beneficence, benefit, beneficial. So it has to do with the well-being and safety of the other person and ensuring that what you provide is beneficial to the person receiving occupational therapy service. So what does that mean when it comes to doing evaluations? That means we are not using assessments that are outdated or irrelevant or inappropriate um, when we're doing evaluations. So we have to be careful to choose one that is appropriate and that meets the, meets the needs of the, our client. And when we are doing intervention planning or techniques or choosing um, equipment, that we're doing so based on evidence-based practice that is relevant recognized within our scope of occupational therapy practice and that we are also uh, providing reassessment and reevaluation in a timely manner to make sure or not to make sure but to determine if the uh, goals are being met and whether or not our intervention plan should be revised and if the goals are being met and services are no longer needed it is important to terminate the service now, just as it's important to initiate the service and respond to referral in a timely manner, it is also our ethical uh, obligation, duty, to make sure that the services are terminated when the service is no longer needed. Okay? Am I talking really fast today? <laughs> I didn't even have coffee today, but I'm like, I'm oh, really chatty. 
<laughs> anyway, so let's continue to talk about beneficence. And now we're going to talk about what we can do for ourselves in order to ensure that we are considering the well-being and safety of our clients. And for one, we need to make sure that we're providing evidence-based care that is within our level of competence and scope of practice. So in other words, making sure that we have the qualifications and experiences uh, to provide whatever service we're providing. And it also means that when we're faced with something that we've never heard of or that we are unfamiliar with, that we would take steps to use careful judgment. And guys, this is especially the case in the areas of new or emerging technology or practice areas. So for example, if you have a patient who comes to you with alternative treatment ideas and you're not sure if it's uh, safe or beneficial, you have to do your own research and literature review first to determine that it would be safe and that it would be beneficial for them. And finally, the code of beneficence also applies when we're conducting study, research studies. So in order to uh, protect the participants, we have to adhere to the ethical guidelines when we're conducting and disseminating research. And a part of doing that includes determining potential risks as well as benefits. Okay, so I know that sounded a bit redundant. I went over beneficence quite in detail, but the point to remember uh, for beneficence is to consider and demonstrate uh, a concern for the well-being and safety of all who are receiving the services. Okay. Um, the second one, we're going to talk about non-maleficence. And similar to beneficence, this one, you can also find the word, the clue in the word, non mal Maleficence. So mal, uh, the Latin root for the word mal is bad and evil. And I also think of malo or mal in Espanol, and that also means wrong or bad, right? So um, anything that's evil, <laughs> bad, harmful for the patient, we do not want to do. So we just talked about beneficence. We are doing good. We're going to benefit. We're going to be benevolent. We're going to do everything that is good for the patient and benefit. When we are talking about non-maleficence, we are talking about avoiding and restraining from doing what is harmful for the patient. And so what does that include? Um, irresponsible behavior and conduct. So coming to work drunk, inebriated, or intoxicated, or doing drugs while you're on site, all of these things that can harm the patient. So that is a no-go. That is evil. It's not adhering to the code of non-maleficence. Second thing, um, oh, so we want to make sure that we are not harming the patient by either neglecting them or abandoning them when uh, they need care. And if for any reason you cannot be there or you cannot provide care because life happens, you have to make sure to facilitate appropriate transition and ensure continuity of care. And if you have personal problems or um, limitations that may end up causing harm, like drug addiction or propensity to be always late, it is your responsibility to then recognize those issues and take appropriate action so that you can rectify those problems. Okay, and third, we want to avoid complicated relationships, and that's whether it is with our patient or patient's family, um, spouse, or it could be a research participant or an employee. Avoid any complicated relationships, and um, what does that include? Uh, sexual activity, right? Having sex with somebody, whether it's consensual or not. As long as you're in a professional relationship, um, this is a no-go because having sex can make it really difficult <laughs> to maintain clear boundaries or objectivity, okay? So does that mean that you can't go out on a date once the service is discontinued? Um, well, that depends. It's certainly not illegal as long as it's consensual, uh, but this is an issue that probably requires a further consideration or investigation uh, because you'd want to make sure that the practitioner isn't using that role or his or her role in an exploitive manner. Another thing, conflict of interest. Uh, so do not use uh, your role as a therapist and um, 
your relationship that was birthed from basically out of the occupational therapy service for your financial, political, religious, or whatever gain that you might want, we don't want to use any anything um, to exploit that relationship that arises out of our relationship through occupational therapy service. So um, non-maleficence is pretty straightforward. Don't harm the patient. Anything that you could think of that might be destructive, that could be harmful, it is a no-go. All right, so now we're gonna talk about autonomy, and that's the third one and my favorite one. Uh, and this is, has everything to do with self-determination, our right to freedom, our right to choose, our right to privacy, all of those things that I think are so important in my own life. So this is my favorite. But basically, according to this code of ethic, we make sure that we respect the rights and the desires of the patient Whatever the patient, if the patient refuses to receive service for whatever reason it may be, we have to respect that right. And we cannot try to coerce or threaten or convince them to receive service when the patient has expressed that they do not want to receive the service. And in a similar way that we can't coerce the patient to receive occupational therapy service, we also can't uh, force them not to engage in things that we know are harmful uh, or that may not uh, uh, facilitate recovery. So for example, um, let's say that the patient is healing from a wound or from an injury and you know that it would be dangerous or not the ideal situation for that person to go swimming right away or to go skiing. Can we stop that person from going? No, because they have a right to choose and they are their own agent. They make decisions in their own life. But what we do have an obligation to is to educate them and to let them know what the risks are if they choose to go swimming or to engage in activities that may delay their healing or um, make it worse in this case. So that is uh, one aspect of autonomy. Oh, another one, a research. It applies to research too. So um, if you have a research participant, as inconvenient as it might be if they choose to drop out at the last minute, they have a right to drop out. And so that's another thing to know for autonomy. So we just talked about the importance of respecting our client's right to refuse service if they want to, either temporarily or permanently, even when that refusal has potential to result in poor outcomes. But I want to stress again the importance of fully disclosing and educating the patient on the benefits and risk and potential outcomes of the intervention so that they can make an informed decision. So they have a right to make a decision about what service they want to or do not want to receive, but we wanna make sure that that decision is an informed decision. And so we wanna facilitate comprehension. And if there are any barriers to communication, whether because they have aphasia or cultural cultural language barrier or literacy, we want to facilitate comprehension and make sure that they fully understand all the benefits and risks and outcomes that are associated with uh, the intervention involved. And when it's um, dealing with the research, we want to also um, ensure that we obtain consent after disclosing all the appropriate information and after we've answered all the questions that are asked by those research participants to ensure that um, they have a full understanding. Um, also under this category is confidentiality, and so we want to make sure that we adhere to HIPAA compliance, right? So um, don't leave the medical records out for everyone to see. Don't talk about patient by their name and um, talk about these case uh, situations in the cafeteria with your colleagues. Um, don't post uh, photos and things that could jeopardize and breach their privacy online. I think uh, social media, it's something that people do really easily and without much thought because we're so accustomed to doing it. And I remember one of my friends uh, went to see her friend in the hospital and um, 
she took a photo and she uploaded it onto Facebook right away and she did it with good intentions to be like, you know, my friend is having a hard time, please pray for him. But you don't know if that patient is okay with that. It's a complete violation of that person's privacy. And as an occupational therapy practitioner, we absolutely do not want to engage in something that would make that person feel that their privacy has been violated, something that may make them feel vulnerable. So think twice before we post things on social media. Um, so for autonomy, we're looking at the self-determination, right to privacy, right to freedom, right to make decisions about their care. Okay? All right, so now we're going to talk about justice. And when you consider justice, I want you to ask the question, is this fair? And will this action or decision allow me to maintain my objectivity and not bias my decision? So it has everything to do with being fair and being objective. So when you're responding to a request for OT services, you want to make sure that it's timely and that you do your best to ensure access to care access to OT service when it is needed. And in an ideal world, it would happen all the time. And we know that um, unfortunately, due to uh, policies and different circumstances, this is not always the case, but that we will do our best, whether through financial assistance or through charity care or through pro bono work, or even like going to Capitol Hill and advocating for better policies, whatever it may be, that we do our best to ensure provision and access to care for those who need OT services. And this also goes to say that you do not provide preferential treatment just because that person has more money or is a celebrity or is your um, idol, whatever it may be, we want to provide fair and equal service that is non-discriminatory. So everything I just talked about was related to social justice, where we talked about providing services in a fair and equitable manner. Um, now I'm going to talk about a different type of justice, and that's procedural justice. And here we're talking about justice as it relates to how we uphold and comply with institutional rules, as well as local, state, federal, and even international laws. And you're actually doing a part of that now by learning the Occupational Therapy Code of Ethics. So let's go through some of these examples of how you can abide by the um, procedural justice principle. And we really have to pay attention here, guys, because these are all the things that we need to know today um, as we're preparing for the board, as well as when we uh, pass and we start practicing. So let's go in order and start with what we need to consider today. And this is something that I've mentioned many times before. You guys are probably tired of it, which is the NBCOT Code of Conduct. But I mention it again because this goes under procedural justice, where we must refrain from using or sharing unauthorized content or educational materials. And this includes not talking about what's covered on the exam, exam test questions, and so on and so forth. I know I talked about this a million times, so we're going to move on. So let's uh, just say that we're done with the exam and we get our certification. Um, what is one of the first things we do for many of us is getting our license, right? So under procedural justice, we are also responsible for holding the requirements Required and appropriate credentials for the services that we provide and it's our responsibility to make sure that we apply for and renew our license when it's time if we're going to be practicing okay um, so now you're licensed and you're working your dream job so what are some of our uh, responsibilities and obligations for one, we are expected to maintain high standards and competence through continued education, uh, research, supervision, and additional training if it's needed. And if you aren't able to provide this for any reason, whether it's uh, due to lack of credentials or qualifications or you just don't have the knowledge base, um, or if it's not within your scope of practice, we have to delegate those duties to others who do have the credentials or knowledge or qualification. So remember, procedural justice involves taking responsibility for maintaining high standards and continuing competence. 
Now, does that sound familiar? I don't want to confuse you, but let's revisit the principle of beneficence again, because beneficence is about the safety and well-being of the client, right? So if you're treating a patient and are asked to do something you're unfamiliar with, what would be the ethical response? Well, similar to what we just talked about, according to beneficence, you would transfer the client to a practitioner who is familiar and experienced while you gain competency. And you would do that because this would be the safe and beneficial action for the client. Well, the same action can also reflect procedural justice because you are doing what it takes to maintain high standards and competency, which is the core of procedural justice. So remember, sometimes uh, one action can reflect more than one principle, and this is why it's really important for us to think through these concepts and clinical scenarios uh, conceptually and from multiple angles. Okay, and also we must maintain awareness of current laws and AOTA policies, and I want you to think about why this might be important. So for example, if you don't understand the ADA requirements and what constitutes as reasonable accommodation, how will you be able to educate or advocate for your patients or employees who need accommodation? Right? So keeping abreast of current laws and AOT policies uh, that may impact or have an impact on the provision of OT services is really important. Moving on to billing. Okay, so when documenting for reimbursement and collecting fees, we must ask ourselves, is this fair? Is it reasonable and commensurate with the services that are provided? We have to be sure to follow reimbursement guidelines for different payer sources and make sure that it complies with applicable laws and guidelines and regulations. All right? What else? Oh, gifts. This is an important one. So you're working and let's say that it's been about a month and you're just killing it. Your colleagues love you, your patients adore you, and they start to bring you gifts. What do you do? <laughs> Well, another aspect of procedural justice is refraining from accepting gifts that could influence your relationship or blur the professional boundaries. And that makes sense, right? I mean, imagine someone coming to you with a bunch of money or accessories or gifts. Wouldn't that bias you or influence the relationship that you have? So if you're ever offered a gift, um, I know it's nice, but be sure to stop and consider um, and adhere to the employer policies. Okay, now we're going to move on to research and how that fits into procedural justice. Uh, if you're interested in conducting a study, it is really important to obtain all necessary approvals before you conduct your study. And finally, um, transparency. And uh, this is another important one. Let's say that you're participating in a business arrangement and you are an owner or a stockholder or partner or employee. You must be transparent about that and disclose your relationship and potential conflict of interest. So that was a lot, um, but just remember that procedural justice has to do with abiding by and complying with the rules and regulations to make sure that we are all maintaining high standards and ethics. And that wraps up our review of social and procedural justice. Next, veracity. This has everything to do with truthfulness. So when you are thinking of veracity, think verifying for truth. And this has to do with whether you're writing your bio, your um, report, your documentation, uh, sending out brochures, whatever it may be, you want to transmit accurate honest information. So for example, all of us will pass the MBCOT and we're going to apply for our first job using our resume. And when we're drafting this resume, we want to make sure that everything we write about ourselves in terms of our experience, years of experience, credentials, that is accurate. Also, when you are writing your documentation, you want to be sure to um, 
be honest about the type and duration of the services that was provided. Also, if you have a field work student or if you have an employee that you're working with and you're writing a performance evaluation or report, you want to make sure that you don't falsify that or you don't use exaggeration, that it is an accurate reflection to the best of your ability. Um, also, this has to do with your work and citation. You want to make sure that if you are uh, using other people's work that you properly credit that work. It would not be honest and true if you took somebody's work and didn't give um, correct citation or credit to that person, right? So that also has to do with truthfulness. Um, it also has to do with being truthful um, when you are talking about your program. So if you're a program director and you're recruiting um, prospective students, students, you want to be honest and truthful and accurate about what you say about the program and what it offers, right? So everything to do with truthfulness and being honest falls under veracity, okay? So that one's pretty straightforward and it's easy. Last one, we're going to talk about fidelity. And this comes from the Latin root meaning loyal. So when I think about fidelity, I like to think faithfulness, fidelity, faithfulness. And it's not only faithfulness with your patients or clients, but it's also faithfulness with your colleagues, people you work with, uh, within your organization and to your profession. And so making sure that you represent uh, our profession in the best way possible, that you don't do things that make the public lose trust in our profession, and that you um, maintain a very professional and respectful working environment and relationship with your colleagues, and that when you are in a a multidisciplinary team that you understand your roles and responsibilities and how they differ and how distinct it is from other uh, uh, disciplines role and responsibility so that you can maintain a collaborative working environment it also has to do with making sure that you don't slander or gossip or disseminate or disclose private information about other people I mean all of these things sound like common sense and it's things that we probably wouldn't do but it's good to know that they fall under fidelity so making sure that you do everything within your power and in accordance with the code of ethics to ensure a response respectful, collaborative, and professional environment. And that also includes avoiding things that could give rise to conflict of interest. So not using your role and your title and your status and, and for your personal gain or benefit. Um, and I think that's about it. But again, that concludes our code of ethics, but I want you to really go back to the AOTA PDF and read the whole thing because I really just outlined the major parts and um, I gave you a starting point, but it'll give you a much more comprehensive understanding if you just read through it once, okay? Or twice, or three times. <laughs> Um, all right, well, I've met my goal for today, so I want to encourage you to do whatever it is that gives you joy and meaning and cross off that goal this weekend, and I will see you guys next Wednesday when I make my announcement. So until then, take care.